This is the School Ager and Adolescent Growth and Development Lecture by Professor Williams. The School Age Child. We define school age as ages 6 to 12 years old. There's a little variation there, but to keep it clear for tests, six years marks the beginning of the school age and ends at 12 years, but of course there's a little bit of gray area on either end. This, uh, this age period is marked by, um, by the loss of the first tooth and ends uh, when puberty begins. This is a period of gradual growth and development. With the infant and the toddler, we saw with the infant extremely rapid growth. In the toddler, it was still fairly rapid. The preschoolers slow down quite a bit, and here it's very gradual. So we don't see changes as quickly or as, a, or, or as significantly as we did in those younger stages. What we do see in the school ager, however, is a progression with their physical and, and emotional maturity. So m much of the growth and changes are internal. This child is probably around seven years old. Um, he's lost his two bottom teeth and one top tooth and is waiting for that top tooth to come in. You can even see the tooth just beginning to peek through. The school ager is more graceful. Their legs are longer, they have a lower center of gravity and improved posture. We also um, see diminished fat on the school ager, so they have a leaner appearance. Later in school age, kind of that middle school, um, which would be approximately like, you know, 11 to 12, that fifth and sixth grade as they go, get ready to go to middle school, um, they're going to go through the ugly duckling stage. So think back for just a minute to those couple of years that you felt were your most awkward. I can tell you for me, it was definitely um, fourth and fifth grade were a little awkward, and then sixth grade I felt was a little better, um, and middle school was kind of okay. But for me, it was like fourth and fifth grade felt the most awkward. And that is the time when the face is growing faster than the cranium, and so the face is a little too big for the size of the head. The teeth are too large. Um, as their adult teeth are coming in, and their mouth still doesn't look really big. So I kind of I call it uh, the chiclet teeth stage. If you've ever seen the chiclets come, it's like two big white square teeth in the front just like sticking out and screaming at you. Very large, kind of awkward. Um, and as everything kind of starts to balance out, their head growth catches up with their face. It all kind of evens out. And then um, the child will be what we consider more attractive as they grow into themselves. Uh, their body organs are mostly mature. Really the only part of the body that, um, or the only organ that is not mature is the brain. And the brain really doesn't complete its development till mm, somewhere in like early adolescence. So we see an increased stomach capacity and an increased bladder capacity. So we can take these kids on road trips and not have to stop for the bathroom every five minutes, which is kind of nice um, from like a parent perspective. Their heart, and heart rate and respiratory rate are, again, they're going to steadily decrease until they hit that normal um, for adults. And that's going to be sometime toward the end of the school age years. Their blood pressure is increasing, again, until it reaches that normal adult level. Their immune system is more competent. They've been exposed to germs for a few years. They've been able to build immunity to many things. So their immune system is stronger and much more able to fight off infection. However, their bones and muscles are still developing. So that's one area of the body that we need to remember is not fully developed and is vulnerable to injury. So if we're not, if we don't tell these children to be careful with lifting and with strenuous activity and sports, they're really at risk for injury.
Skills of fine and gross motor development include, for gross motor, uh, the ability to ride a two-wheel bike um, with training wheels at first and then um, without. Uh, they are able to jump rope, uh, do things like hopscotch, dancing, sports, those types of activities. Fine motor skills are going to be re related to their improved uh, hand-eye coordination. So things like playing musical instruments, um, writing, building crafts, things like that. Uh, we'll also see them play more video games, those types of things. Pre-adolescence is that period two years before the child actually hits puberty. So in puberty, we say in girls is about two years earlier than boys, and that puberty begins at age 10 in girls and 12 in boys. Now, I am aware that age 10 is technically before the end of school age, and we say school age is 12. I'm just trying to keep it nice and round for you, but that's that gray, gray area in between. So just remember that girls are gonna hit puberty a little bit earlier and boys a couple years later. According to Erickson, um, the child is developing a sense of industry or stage of accomplishment. So this stage um, is industry versus inferiority, and inferiority will be on the next slide. Um, so we want them to develop a sense of industry, feel like they're accomplishing something. This child is going to be eager to develop uh, skills and participate in meaningful and socially useful work, which is kind of a fancy way of saying they like doing stuff. They are developing a growing sense of independence, and peer approval is beginning to become a, sm a strong motivator for this age group. They take pride in their accomplish and want to tell everyone about good grades. Um, they like material rewards. Um, they like being rewarded with additional privileges. They want those accomplishments to be recognized and be rewarded. On the flip side of that is they're at risk for developing a sense of inferiority. So feelings may derive from their self or their social environment that make them feel inferior. So they could just automatically feel that way, or it could be that some other child is making them feel bad about themselves, making them feel inferior. This may occur if they're incapable or unprepared to assume the responsibilities expected. So if there's a standard set for their behavior and they know they're not doing a good job at it, they're automatically going to feel like they're inferior. And some of that is normal. We all have those ups and downs, but we don't want that to be kind of their, um, their norm. Okay, All children are going to feel some degree of inferiority regarding skills they cannot master. Not every kid is going to be a rock star on the football field. Not every kid is going to be really, really smart. Um, every child will have their own set of strengths and weaknesses. In terms of cognitive development, the school ager is in the concrete operational stage. In this stage, thought processes are logical and coherent. They make sense. They can reason things out. They have a much more accurate understanding of cause and effect. We no longer see that transductive reasoning occur. They develop an understanding of relationships between things and ideas. Uh, they can classify things, and they may start to have collections of, like when I was a kid, we collected stickers. That was like the big thing for girls to collect stickers, and we had like books full of stickers. Um, it, you know, the generation before mine, it was stamps and coins. And so um, every, it seems like every generation has their own thing they want to connect, uh, like collect Maybe for this generation, it's uh, the Pokemon Go stuff, um, which isn't even real. Uh, they're able to make judgments based upon uh, reason instead of just what they see, so they are much better at conceptual thinking. And they master the concept of conservation, which we'll talk about a little bit more in class. And this is where we alter the arrangement of things in space, um, yet it doesn't change their properties. So... Um, a good example might be um, that we have 10 pencils and we can line them all up in order so they're all like evenly spaced. 
um, or, or we can move them so they're staggered. And just because we move them into a new position doesn't mean we change their properties, but sometimes a child who doesn't understand this concept will think that one pencil is longer than the other because it sticks out further in one direction, even though the pencils are the same size. Hopefully that makes sense, but don't worry if it doesn't, we will talk about it. The next slide will kind of show you a few examples as well, but we'll talk about it more in class. So this slide shows you a couple examples um, of how you can demonstrate the concept of conservation. And I was giving you the length example there, which is the fourth one down. Um, and there are lots of different examples. And in class, I'll show you a very short video that gives you a really good ex good idea of how a child understands um, the arrangement of things in space at, before school age and then what happens once they reach the school age. Um, and it's kind of interesting to see how that understanding uh, develops. For the school agers' moral development, again, we're talking about Kohlberg's theory. They fall into what we call the conventional stage. And we talked about with the preschool or the pre-conventional stage, now we're into conventional. So this is where the child is developing a conscience and moral standard. So they have very, um, uh, I wouldn't say very clear, but a more clear idea of what right and wrong is um, than the preschooler does. Rules must be followed for people to be good. So they will assume that if someone breaks a rule, they're a bad person. They'll just make that, make that conclusion all by themselves. They're going to assume that everyone in prison is a bad person and that every police officer is good. And we, of course, know that that's not true, but that is their very black and white perception um, at that age. At, at ages six to seven, reward and punishment still guide choices. They do what we tell them because they don't want to get in trouble. The older school ager, however, is going to be able to judge and act by the intention. So you could have kids out playing ball, for example, and maybe somebody gets hit in the head with a football. And, you know, the kid's like, ow, that hurt. Oh, my gosh. And we're like, hey, are you okay? And they're like, yeah, it was just an accident. So that's that point at which the school ager knows like, yeah, my head got hurt, and yeah, he threw the ball and it hit me, but he wasn't trying to throw the ball at my head. He wasn't being spiteful. It was an accident where the younger child will assume if they got hit in the head that somebody meant to do it and that they were trying to do them harm. So they just don't understand that, uh, you know, the delineation there. Ch children at this age are going to expect to be punished for misbehavior. So they should be punished. We need to really set the standard for them. And not that we as healthcare providers are doing a lot of punishment, but there are consequences for, for decisions. And so we need to enforce rules and make sure that there is a consequence in place. They may also view illness or injury as a punishment for real or imagined misdeeds. So they may have done something wrong and then get sick and think that you know they deserved it because of what they had done wrong. School agers engage mainly in cooperative play. So we see a lot of team play um, working together. Um, it could be, you know, uh, sports, uh, soccer, uh, board games, all kinds of team and group play. When they play as a team, they learn to uh, to change uh, their personal goals and substitute those with team goals and really think of their team as a whole rather than them as an individual. They learn the importance of winning and losing. They learn rules and rituals. Um, and we see this a lot like with board games and team sports, as I mentioned. Um, winning and losing is really, really important because you're not always a winner in life. Um, there may be times when someone grows up, they work really hard, they do everything exactly right, follow the rules, all of that, and yet they may still not get the promotion, still not reap the, the reward for all their hard work. And so it's important for children to learn early on how to lose and how to lose with grace. So a good example of what one of my biggest concerns 
is with children today is that many children are given awards just for showing up that like everybody gets a trophy type mentality that really concerns me because that's not how life works when you become an adult. Um, and I think it kind of sets them up for not learning how to cope with failure or learning how to cope with disappointment. We also see a lot of TV and video games and how that technology impacts um, the child's health. Mainly, it leads to decreased activity. The more children sit in front of screens, the more they're going to snack and eat and eat and eat, even when they're not hungry. Um, and those things combined have led to a really high rate of obesity in children. So we have to do a lot of educating parents on you know, health and, and activity and nutrition. The school ager is extremely proud of their accomplishments. They want to show everyone what they can do, show off skills, um, make their parents proud of them and receive that recognition. So putting our, uh, you, know, you know, putting children in activities where they have the opportunity to grow and learn new things is really important for their self-esteem. Their social relationships are centered around same-sex peers. So boys generally want to play with boys and girls want to play with girls. So it's pretty divided at this age. Um, they recognize the importance of the peer group. They have a culture with their own set of rules. I kind of always think of the Little Rascals, if you ever used to watch that show where they have a clubhouse and there's a big sign on the door that says, no girls allowed. Boys are definitely in their own little world and don't necessarily want to be around girls um, and vice versa. So, um, and that identification with peers is a strong motivator um, is a strong influence in a child uh, gaining independence from their parents. They also become increasingly sensitive to social norms and pressures of the peer group. So that whole idea of peer pressure where um, I think girls more at this age care about wearing certain shoes or certain brand of pants or, or whatever it is. Um, boys maybe care about, you know, you know like having the, the, the newest skateboard or the newest you know, game system or something like that. So they're going to become increasingly aware of, uh, of the pressure to fit in. Social relationships have really changed in the last 10, even 20 years. Uh, technology has had a huge impact on how kids socialize. Think about the impact of cell phones, texting, um, even the apps that children can download on their phones and how accessible that makes their friends and other online content. The use of email may still be somewhat of an issue, although children really aren't using email very much. Email is considered by many kids and millennials as outdated. So they tend to use other means of connecting. Social networking is still a huge draw. There, of course, is Facebook and Twitter, but kids today have really moved away from those even and are using, they're much more likely to use something like Instagram, although even that a little less frequently. They're using Snapchat and other apps like Kick and Twitch, and the list probably goes on and on and on. They also are staying connected through gaming networks. The amount of kids doing online gaming or doing a like a party chat while they play a game with their friends allows them to connect with each other pretty much at any time. They also are involved in clubs and peer groups, so we still are seeing things like Girl Scouts, Boy Scouts, and other types of groups. Even sports uh, allow kids to make those connections. So soccer, football, you know, the, again, the list goes on. Anything that has some kind of formal function allows kids to kind of, you know, network, I guess you can say, or stay in contact. So it, 
you know, they're pretty much connected to each other all of the time, very much unlike most of us adults when we were children. As the child gets older, um, they're going to shift kind of away from from needing their parents, just a, a touch at this age. So parents are still the primary influence in shaping the child's personality, behavior, and value system. As they approach uh, uh, adolescence, we're going to see a, you know kind of a shift away from you know needing their parents as much. Um, they have an increasing level of independence from their parents, and this is really the primary goal of middle childhood for the child to go to school. Um, learn to do more for themselves and become more independent. This is really essential for kids to grow up and be ready to live independently and take care of themselves. Children are definitely not ready to abandon parental control um, until they're really approaching adolescence. They need their parents as adults, not as friends. So it's really important that we talk to parents about making sure that they are setting boundaries and enforcing rules and not letting the child, um, you know, you know, rule the roost, so to speak. Children are developing a body image um, in, in the school age years. They generally like their physical selves less as they grow older, which I think is really sad. But the more they see their bodies changing and um, as they get older, they see what what the ideal for beauty is and they like themselves less and less. So it really can be damaging to their self-esteem if they're comparing themselves to other people. Uh, their body image is influenced by significant others. So that's the good news. I guess it could be bad news, but I like to think of it as good news. We as important adults in children's lives, as parents, as teachers, as friends, as caregivers, extended family members, we have a real, real opportunity to in to you know positively influence a child's body image by you know you know telling them that they are beautiful, they are special, um, and really you know, recognizing the uniqueness um, of each individual. They're increasingly aware of differences, um, and this may in, um, you know, worsen those feelings of inferiority, especially if they have you know hearing deficit or vision deficit. Maybe it's they wear glasses, although I think that's much more acceptable today. Um, kids don't seem to be teased so much for that. It's a lot of other things um, that they're getting teased for. In terms of nutrition, sleep, and dental care, the school ager is going through uh, some minimal changes for the most part. Um, their body fat um, a percentage is going to increase. Girls are going to gain more body fat than boys. Um, their diet preferences don't really change, and that's because the habits um, and tastes for foods have already been well established. So whatever their parents have been feeding up to this point, that is what those kids are going to love. We want to teach parents to limit sugar and encourage them to get enough physical activity. So whether it is just lots of playing, sports, or structured exercise, um, all of those are very important. In terms of sleep, um, though they're going to start with a need for about 12 hours of sleep, and it'll taper off as they get older. So 12 hours for the 6 to 8-year-old, then between 8 and 10 years of age, more like 10 to 12 hours. And then between ages 10 and 12, it'll drop to like 9 to 10 hours of sleep. So minimum, as you could see, ideally would be about 9 to 10 hours. And the younger school ager will need even more. So like your first and second graders are going to need a little bit more sleep than the older school agers. They also need regular dental visits. We need to teach them how to brush their teeth and floss. And this is the age where um, they'd be getting sealants. And for some kids, they're going to start start getting braces at this age as well. In terms of coping um, with the concerns related to normal growth and development, 
uh, the school experience, so being in school, is second only to the family as an important socializing agent. This means that the parents or the family unit, their influence is still the number one, the most important, but that school takes a close second. So it, it's going to really, what they're exposed to at school is going to have a, a big impact on them. They're going to start um, to learn what the normal values are in society, which may not necessarily be in line with the values within the home. Uh, bullying is um, on the rise in school agers. With boys, we tend to see uh, the use of physical force. Girls, it's, um, it's often psychological means, um, like uh, you know, leaving them out or ostracizing them, starting rumors, those types of things, excluding them. Cyberbullying is becoming more common. About 10% of kids in school are afraid of being bullied, and 25% of kids report being bullied at some point. Children who are overweight or have health issues are also more likely to be bullied. So parents and teachers you know, really need to have an awareness about this. Some of the normal concerns related to the growth and development of the school ager is, is the school experience and the impact that it has on our children. Um, thank goodness it's second to family in terms of socializing children. So family still has the greatest influence on the child, but school is a really big impactor. So a negative school experience can really impact um, the child's uh, self-esteem and uh, you know, normal development. They also, the older they get, um, are you know, bombarded with the values of society rather than their community and family. So ha having a good foundation for our children, it will help to protect them from being uh, vulnerable to those outside influences. We also begin to see some dishonest behavior in previously well-behaved children. They may begin lying, stealing, or cheating. Um, the lying may be as simple as exaggerating or telling stories, but they are now old enough to distinguish between fact and fantasy. So this really isn't um, an acceptable behavior, and sometimes we have to um, provide them with consequences so they can learn. Most of the cheating we see occurs in five and six-year-olds because they find it very difficult to lose a game. They want to win so badly that they will, you know, be dishonest in a game. And I remember playing Candyland with like my nieces and nephews, my old children, and they definitely, I've seen them try to move extra spaces or um, try to be dishonest about what their, you know, what color their card was, those types of things. So that should be expected. Not that we consider it okay, but it is normal. Injury prevention is also important with the school ager. Uh, the most common cause of severe injury and death in school age children is motor vehicle crashes. This includes uh, pedestrian car accidents or uh, passenger accidents. So they could be on a bike being hit or you know, walking and being hit or actually just be in a vehicle when it's in an accident. It's really important that we teach seat belts and booster seat laws and making sure that parents are restraining their children safely and properly in the vehicle to prevent injury. We also see a ton of bicycle injuries, so bike helmets are really important. I've even um, seen a lot of injuries where kids um, hit something and go forward over the handlebars, and the handlebars will hit them right in the lower abdomen, and it can actually tear through the muscle and cause injuries um, that need to be stitched up. So we can have some pretty significant injuries from bicycles, even if we're wearing helmets. Um, so riding a bicycle responsibly is also really important. We also want to teach appropriate safety equipment for all sports. Um, so we talked about bike helmets, but we need to talk about um, knee pads and elbow pads for skateboarding, things like that, making sure that kids are wearing pads and helmets for certain sports, things like that. Very, very important because remember, their brains are still developing and their bones and muscles are still developing. So really important to teach the importance of those things.
Here you can see some school agers riding their bicycles wearing helmets. I think today it is much more accepted or even expected than it used to be. So that stigma of bike helmets not being cool, I think, has improved dramatically. The Adolescent and Family This picture shows a good comparison of boys as they transition um, into men. We always think of girls ha having the most significant or most obvious physical changes, but these um, are the same three boys um, before they went into puberty and then as teenagers. And you can see the difference is pretty significant, how much thinner their faces are, um, their necks get thicker. You can see their Adam's apples, they really leaned out. Um, it just, I think, is a good um, you know, comparison for people to see. Adolescence is a transition between childhood and adulthood. It's a period of rapid physical, cognitive, social, and emotional uh, maturation. Notice I didn't say growth because they're not really, um, until they hit their growth spurt, there's not a ton of growth that's happening with them. It's more the maturity that we're seeing occur. Generally, um, it's defined as beginning with the onset of puberty and ending with the cessation of body growth. So puberty, um, you know, is happening earlier than it used to, but we're still going to say 13 um, for the beginning of adolescence. And then usually the body stops growing around age 18. So that's kind of a good rule of thumb. There's a dramatic increase in growth that accompanies uh, the sexual maturation of an adolescent. So the adolescent growth spurt um, will happen kind of in a short period of time. We see about 20 to 25% of their total adult height achieved during puberty. So that's a good chunk, and it usually occurs within 24 to 36 month period. And um, with their growth or with their development, we have um, a characteristic sequence of changes. So um, we know that, um, for example, uh, the child's going to have um, armpit hair before a girl has breast buds, um, before we see pubic hair, those types of things. So we can pretty much predict um, you know, the sequence in which those changes are going to take place. By this age, the organ systems are pretty much matured now. We, um, so even though the brain is done growing, it's still developing. Um, the myelination is continuing to occur. We see an increase in blood volume, an increase in lung capacity, an increase in muscle mass and strength, especially in boys. And then we also are going to see wisdom teeth come in between 17 and 20 years of age. And we're also seeing a shift away from even removing wisdom teeth. So that will become less and less common as long as there's room for those wisdom teeth to grow in. Fine and gross motor skills continue to um, improve in the adolescent. Um, because of their uneven growth spurts, that may equate to coordination problems. So like the kid who grows like six inches in a short period of time, maybe a little bit more uncoordinated playing sports, running, catching the ball, things like that until the child kind of grows into their new size and new body proportion. So that can kind of throw them off. They're going to... Um, become better at tasks that are related to things that they're interested to. So they're going to concentrate on developing skills relevant to sports that they're into and activities that they like. They are improving their skills with computers and let's face it, um, all, um, all types of technology. So smartphones and tablets and all of that as well. And their you know, handwriting should be improving. They've got better uh, or more refined uh, uh, dexterity and ability um, to manipulate and write well.
In terms of psychosocial development, the teenager is developing a sense of identity. So it's identity versus role confusion. And so identity, of course, is the positive side. We don't want to see role confusion. So the goal is for them to develop an identity independent from parental authority. Usually this is going to start out through an early adolescent crisis. So there's going to be a moment which it kind of becomes clear to the teenager and they tell their parents, you don't know anything. You're stupid. I, I can do it myself. I don't need you. And they have kind of this moment where they think they don't need their parents. And that's kind of that first shift toward becoming independent. And there's a lot of back and forth, a lot of ambivalence and confusion and struggle as they kind of you know, uh, you know, navigate the water, so to speak. We also see them uh, developing a group identity. If the if the teenager doesn't feel like they fit in with a group, they are going to feel alienated. So we really want them to make friends and find some sort of group acceptance um, to help with their socialization and make them feel important. Because no matter how many friends they have, um, in adolescence there is. Um, a lot of feelings of loneliness, even though they're very social, they are spending time together, they go out, they do parties, go to dances, I mean, whatever it is that they're doing, they, still the teenager feels somewhat lonely at times. So it's important that they feel that acceptance from their peers. They're also going to develop their sex role identity, and we'll talk about that more later. In terms of cognitive development, the teenager is now entering the formal operation stage. Um, in this stage, um, we see the teenager developing the ability to think abstractly, kind of see the big picture. Instead of seeing the tree, they see the forest. They can um, like understand concept ideas. Um, their thought is adaptable and flexible. They can think beyond the present, uh, make plans for the future. They can use scientific reasoning and formal logic. They can mentally manipulate multiple variables, and they're more concerned about others' thoughts and needs. So they're um, able to kind of see from others' viewpoints and really like appreciate um, like opposing views about things. In terms of moral development, they're entering the post-conventional stage. So at this point, they have an, an internalized set of moral principles. Um, they begin to question the existing moral values and the relevance of those values to society. And they may actually change their views. Um, they'll have been taught one thing by their parents, and then they'll kind of make decisions for themselves as to whether they really believe that. They understand duty and obligation and the reciprocal rights of others. They also understand and believe in the concepts of, of, um, of justice and reparation. So they understand that there will be punishment and they want to see people who commit crimes go to prison. Um, they also um, see people trying to make amends or um, you know, give reparation, which is doing something to make up for whatever you did wrong. Their relationships with parents and peers are changing too in adolescence. So um, with their parents, their roles change from, from protection and dependence to one of mutual affection and equality. So where the parent took care of them and protected them and did everything and the child was dependent on the parent, now there's going to be this more of a respectful balance and um, a shift to equality. Uh, the process involves much turmoil and ambiguity. And emancipation from parents may um, begin the re rejection of parents by the teen. And I kind of mentioned there'd be like this moment where the teenager tries to assert their independence. And that's what I'm talking about there. In terms of peers, they, uh, their peers are going to um, like assume an increasingly important role in the adolescent's life. Um, their peer groups provide them with a sense of belonging and feelings of strength and power. Peers are also their yardstick for measuring normal. The teenager's leisure activities center around their peers. So everything they do is going to be about spending time with their friends and being social. 
Um, the adolescent may also begin to get a job, work, and those work experiences may provide benefits like learning to work as a team, how to manage income, um, you know, time management concerns may arise, but they're learning to manage time, to juggle school, um, maybe sports activities, and their job. And so that's a good kind of uh, you know, introduction to adulthood where they're going to be doing those things all of the time. Although puberty technically begins often in school age, in adolescence we see a lot of body changes and a lot of those uh, uh, pubertal changes moving into adolescence. Uh, puberty is actually marked by the development of secondary sex characteristics. These are the result of hormone changes. They include uh, voice changes, hair growth, breast enlargement, and fat deposits. They do play no direct role in reproduction. So think about the breast getting larger. You don't necessarily need enlarged breasts to participate in the reproductive process, but they are changes we associate with puberty. Androgens or masculinizing hormones are those hormones responsible for the rapid growth of the early teen. So as those begin to be produced in greater numbers, that's when we see that incredibly rapid growth spurt. Of course, girls are going to start puberty earlier than boys. We say that girls are going to begin puberty somewhere between 9 and 11 years, although it can be before age 9 in some cases, and it can be well after 11 years in others. What we are first going to see in the girl is uh, the development of breast buds and pubic hair. Then approximately two years after the breast buds and pubic hair begin and we see those fat deposits and all of that, then we'll see that very first period, of course, and, and the onset of periods we call menarche. So, and that is typically two years after those prepubescent changes. So the average age for that first period is 12.8 years of age. So think of that as somewhere between maybe sixth and seventh grade as average. Normal, though, is considered any time between nine and 15 years of age. This slide shows um, uh, the Tanner stages. Um, so stage one isn't pictured here, but uh, stage one is just what a prepubescent girl looks like. And you can see stage two, three, four, and five, and how the development of breasts occur And here you can see that same, uh, those same stages uh, for pubic hair. Um, here you can see stage one, but it's stage one, two, three, four, and five. And again, that is called the Tanner staging. And we use that both for boys and girls. Boys are going to start puberty just a smidge later, somewhere between 10 and 11 years of age. So their first body changes include the enlargement of the testicles, thinning, reddening, and increased looseness in the skin of the scrotum. And that those will occur somewhere between 9.5 to 14 years. So again, we say 10 to 11, but it could be a little bit earlier and it could be significantly later than that. We also see a penile enlargement, the growth of pubic hair, voice changes, and the growth of facial hair. And here you can see the Tanner staging for the development um, of, of pubic hair and the enlargement of the penis. So you can see stages one, two, three, four, and five. So adolescents really develop a lot of, you know, their sexuality in adolescence, even though we talked about it long ago with the toddler as it was starting in those early stages. But in the teenager, we see them beginning to date. 
It may start as a hanging out with friends and friends of the opposite sex. We also see a lot of group dating where you have a group of kids that just all get together. It is common to see uh, sexual experimentation, even kids experimenting uh, with same-sex uh, relationships, even though they may identify later as being um, straight. It is, uh, is greatly impacted by the media influences. So think of the impact of television and music and video games and all of those outside influences and how that may impact sexual development. Our teens who identify themselves as LGBT, they tend to self-identify that they are not heterosexual or straight um, later on. So they tend to be older when they've um, identified that about themselves. Because of this, there is oftentimes for those kids or teens internal struggle. There may be fear of telling their parents, fear of their peers finding out, uh, uh, you know, not knowing how they're going to react and be treated, whether they're going to be teased. I feel like today we've seen an improvement in that and much more acceptance. However, there are still some areas of the country, some families, some communities where they are very much not accepting of teens who identify themselves as LGBTQ. We also, as a result of that, see those teens at a higher risk for feeling isolated, attempting suicide, and potentially running away. So it's not that we're going to think that every kid who says, I am gay, is going to be at risk for suicide. But we want to be aware of teens that are struggling with those feelings. And um, especially if there isn't that self-awareness, that we do need to keep a close eye on them and provide them with the support that they need. Uh, at this age also, we see the sexual aspects of interpersonal relationships becoming more important. So rather than what you might see early in middle school where kids have a boyfriend or a girlfriend and they're going out, but they don't kiss, they don't really touch, they just kind of think the other person is cute. And then in the teen years, of course, they begin to become much more physical and we see more of a sexual need developing. The teenager is continuing the development of their self-concept and body image. In early adolescence, there tends to be um, a lot of feelings of confusion. They are acutely aware of their appearance and their comparison of appearance with others. They um, see any blemishes or defects that they perceive. They are magnified way out of proportion. So I might look at a teenager and not even notice that they have a pimple on their face because big deal, we all get pimples, right? But you'll be talking to a teenager who will tell you that they see that pimple as like a shining beacon to everybody. It might as well be a red blinking light saying, hey, look, I have a pimple. Because the, to the teenager, it's a really big deal and they're very embarrassed sometimes. Eventually, they'll mature to a self-image that is based on their uniqueness and individuality. They become more comfortable with who they are, and I think that continues well into adulthood. Some people don't really achieve that until adulthood. Nutrition is a big concern with teenagers. They tend to make very poor food choices, eat a lot of junk food, eat lots of candy, drink energy drinks and pop and all kinds of things that aren't good for them. Uh, they do have an increase in calorie needs, especially during that growth spurt. However, we need to teach them and work with them to make sure that they have a well-balanced diet and that they're also getting enough physical activity. So kids being involved in sports and other outdoor and physical activities are really important for health and creating good habits that can carry them into adulthood. We need to encourage good dental care, make sure that we're talking to teens about the importance of, of brushing effectively and flossing. We need to talk to them about stress management. We need to talk to them about the need that they have for at least eight and a half to nine and a half hours of sleep. So many teenage, teenagers stay up really late at night and then they have to get up early to be at 
you know, high school at like 7.30 in the morning. So they generally don't get enough sleep. So, and it's natural for them to stay up late. That's how their kind of sleep pattern and activity uh, pattern changes. So that's normal. So I always feel like it's ridiculous to have teenagers going to you know school at 7 or 7.30 in the morning when we know they're naturally going to be night owls. So it seems to me that they should be sleeping in a little bit later and going to school later. But the need to have sports and jobs after school has kind of you know necessitated that need for them to start school early. We also want to promote learning and uh, good uh, study habits and you know working hard to keep grades up, clubs and hobbies, things that will help prepare them for adulthood, jobs, time management, stress management, managing, you know, all of those things that we have to worry about as adults. So that will help kind of lay the foundation as they move into adulthood. When we're doing education with teenagers, we want to include lots of information on disease prevention. We want to talk to them, talk to them about skin care and acne. We want to talk to them about piercing, tattooing, um, uh, surgical steel implants, all kinds of interesting things that kids are doing in their bodies the, these days, gauges, um, all of those type of physical embellishments, so to speak. Um, we also want to talk to them about sports injuries for kids that are very active. Um, we want to talk to them about the risk for, uh, for repetition injury and keep them as healthy as possible. We want to talk to them about anemia. This kind of goes along with nutrition, poor nutrition can lead to anemia. So we want to make sure that kids are getting um, a balanced diet. We want to talk to them about sexually transmitted infections and how to, um, to have sex safely and, and to protect themselves. We also want to talk about obesity and good eating habits and activity and eating disorders. Teenagers um, are at the point where you take the combination of the body image concerns um, and their and their desire to be more attractive, they're at risk for developing eating disorders. We see a lot of anorexia and bulimia, um, lots of abuse and bullying um, in teenagers as well. Uh, it could be a boyfriend to girlfriend. It could be parents who are abusing their kids. So the teenager might be being abused, might be the abuser. Lots of ways that can play out. But we want to talk to them about what to do if they see someone that they think is being abused, or where to go for help if they're being abused. Teenagers today are growing up in a culturally diverse world. Um, the makeup of children and teenagers in the U.S. is um, really diverse, which is wonderful. It's this amazing melting pot of all different um, like cultural and ethnic groups, and it's really cool. Um, but there also needs to be an increasing awareness of how to interact with different cultures. In 2002, 45% of children in the U.S. were comprised of minorities, which is great. Um, you know, it used to be just a very small percentage of children were minorities, so we're seeing this huge shift in the makeup of of the people in the United States. Uh, um, cultures that children or these teenagers are going to be exposed to range from permissive to really conservative towards teen issues. So some cultures are going to be very understanding and forgiving, like of sexual exploration, sexual orientation, all of those things. And other cultures are going to be very, very, very traditional, very strict, and not be very, very open to other views and other um, you know, belief systems and such. So it's important that we as healthcare providers and for, st for these teenagers to grow up being, you know, with an awareness of cultural, ethical, and socioeconomic differences so that we can, one, interact appropriately with different cultures and ethnic groups and be sensitive to what their needs are and for teenagers to be able to do the same.
We're also going to continue teaching about injury prevention. We really want to focus on safe driving, no texting while driving, not being distracted by friends in the car, not being too distracted by radio and dashboard controls, and um, just really focusing on the road itself and driving safely. We also want to uh, talk about the importance of seat belts um, and that they're only going to help if you use them. We want to teach uh, protective equipment for sports, which we already talked about. Um, and diving safety. Um, a lot of teenagers go to the river, go to the lake, um, are swimming with friends without supervision. And there's a real risk um, of diving injury um, or uh, running around being you know, silly and slipping, falling, hitting the head and having a traumatic brain injury. So those two are very common. Uh, my husband actually grew up in Lake Havasu. And they were all out at the lake and they were jumping off cliffs one day and one of his friends jumped off the cliff and they didn't realize he hadn't come out of the water. Everyone was kind of distracted, not paying attention. And it took a while for them to notice he was missing and they they figured out that he that he hadn't come out of the water and, and his body was actually found in the lake. He drowned. Um, he probably like hit his head, was knocked unconscious and then drowned. So it's really scary to think about those types of things happening. So we need to educate our children. We also want to talk about drinking, um, and, and smoking and drug use and really talking about the dangers of those. As we learn more about vaping and e-cigarettes, I'm becoming increasingly concerned about the access that teenagers have to this. I've seen um, many teenagers at my kids' school before they graduated high school, um, you know, using e-cigarettes and vaping. He even told me that at his school, the vice principal had an entire drawer overflowing with e-cigarettes um, that they just can't even keep up with the amount of kids that are vaping. So that that's a big concern. And um, then on top of that, as many as 51% of adolescents have tried an illegal substance. 60% of teens report that drugs are available or sold at their school. There's concerns about drug tolerance and physical dependence. These are involuntary physical responses that are going to impact the level of uh, substance abuse that you'll see, addiction, uh, you know, you know, big, big concerns. The types of substance abuse that we're seeing more frequently today, um, we're seeing an increase in meth and heroin use um, among teenagers, which is very concerning, um, and prescription drugs. We're seeing a 91% increase in, prescri in prescription drug overdose among 15 to 19 year olds. And that is as recently as I think two years ago. We're also seeing the use of bath salts and ecstasy more commonly in teenagers. So, um, I mean, of course, all drugs are big concerns, but some are more concerning with others when you look at um, how they destroy the body and, um, you know, destroy lives. That wraps up the school ager and adolescent voiceover. Here are your references.